One of the wonderful things about living in London is the astonishing art that is available to be seen here, most particularly throughout the trade. My name is Henry Howard Sneed and I'm chair of the board of Asian Art in London for this year of 2021. And this year is no exception. We have a number of wonderful pieces that have been voted for by the participants in terms of choosing the greatest or most attractive or most interesting work of art. And following are some trailers as to the pieces that have gone through to our voting process. We're supported in this exciting endeavour by two important publications, the Antiques Trade Gazette and Apollo Magazine, and I wish to thank them both very much for that support. Hello and welcome to the Asian Art in London 2021 Art Awards. I'm Sophie Kempson, the Programme Development Director. This year there are four awards, two for dealers and two for auction houses in East Asian and Indian and Islamic art. For the first award, I'll now hand you over to Matt Ball from the Antiques Trade Gazette. Hi, I'm Matt Ball. I'm the Publishing Director at Antiques Trade Gazette. And at the Gazette, we're delighted to be partnering with Asian Art in London once again this year. Indeed, we've co-sponsored these awards every year since they began. Uh, this speaks to our long-standing relationship, but also to the success of the organisers in promoting Asian art and London as the hub for Asian art in the Western world. Uh, it's also been a pleasure to participate in the judging panel for the awards, to view the objects in person and to discuss and debate their merits with other experts. And we would encourage everyone not to just visit the shortlist, but as many viewings and exhibitions as possible across the full festival of Asian art in London. And we'd also encourage you to buy and bid for as many items as possible that pique your interest and fire your curiosity. And here is the shortlist for the Antiques Trade Gazette Award for the outstanding Indian and Islamic work of art from an auction house. These six paintings are a magnificent reflection of one of the most intriguing and influential cultural exchanges that took place in the 16th century between the Ottoman Empire and Europe. The paintings depict six of the Ottoman sultans from the House of Osman. They were once part of a set of 14 paintings, of which only six survive. The purpose of these paintings was for the Ottomans to show and cherish their lineage, to be able to show your grandchildren and your ancestors where the House of Osman originated from. These paintings were most certainly a diplomatic present, which would have been a royal request from the Ottomans to the Venetians. Diplomatic presence in the 16th century played an extremely important role, and they had to be done by the best artists at the time in order to show the respect of one ruler and one dynasty for another. This set would have been produced by one of the followers of Paolo Cagliari, also known as Veronese. He was a highly celebrated Venetian artist in the 16th century. The works are fascinating because they have this wonderful sense of realism to them. The personalities of each sitter come across really beautifully as you look closely at every portrait. So we have here Orhan, who was the second ruler of the Ottoman Empire. He's recorded as having had an incredible amount of wealth and power. I love the robe that he's wearing, which gives us a glimpse into the luxurious textiles that were produced and worn at court at the time. We then have Bayezid. Bayezid was known as a very fierce ruler. His nickname was the Thunderbolt because he had so much power and so much energy. We also have Selim the First. Selim was known as Selim the Grim. He was a very moody and serious ruler. He's known to have executed a number of his viziers. And you can see that sense of anger and seriousness in his eyes. There's also Selim II, who was his grandson. He's known to have loved poetry and alcohol, and he was a big supporter of gatherings within the courts. And you can see that sort of personality reflected in the portrait. It's exceptional and it's very rare to have six out of the 14 original set appear at auction. They're in remarkable condition and it's so powerful to have six of the most well-known Ottoman sultans all in one setting. 
My name is Rukmini Rathor and I work as a specialist in the Middle Eastern and Indian Art Department at Sotheby's. We are thrilled to present this extraordinary pair of spectacles from India, which are set with emerald lenses. The emeralds can be traced to mines in Colombia, which speak of Mughal trade connections with the Spanish and the Portuguese. It is astounding to think that the original natural emerald from which these lenses were cut would have weighed over 300 carats. The lenses themselves are less than three millimeters thick. The cleaving of a single large priceless gemstone to produce these lenses attests to the skills of master craftsmen working in the Imperial Mughal workshops in the 17th century. The high transparency of the lenses and their flat cuts suggests that they were meant to be looked through. It is highly probable that they were originally worn as pen's name. They were mounted into their current diamond set frames in the 19th century. These spectacles are poetically named Emeralds for Paradise due to the Islamic association of the color green with paradise and eternal life. We know of no other existing examples, which marks this pair as extremely rare and one of a kind. We will be offering this pair of spectacles as part of our forthcoming sale out of the Islamic world and India on the 27th of October for 1.5 to 2.5 million pounds. Hello, my name is Beatrice Campi and I'm the head of the Islamic and Indian Art Department at Chiswick Auction. And today I'm going to show you one of our top lots, the Shamfran from Ottoman Turkey, 16th century. I know it looks a little bit like an alien helmet, but it's not. Instead, it was specifically for a horse. It's one single plate and you can see the cheek plates on the side joined to the main one through the chain link, the original one. So on the forehead, you have a cartouche with a calligraphic inscription with the Basmala or Bismillahi ar-Rahmani ar-Rahimi, which is the uh, you know the usual quote that you find a lot in Islam, which is in the name of God, the most merciful, the most gracious. This hints that the site of production would have been probably Ottoman Turkey or Anatolia, and similar models have been attributed to the 16th century. This specific shamfran comes from the Vladimir Rosenbaum collection and we have purchased invoices corroborating that provenance, which in the auction world is an absolute dream. He sold it then in 1980 from his gallery, Galleria Serodine in Ascona in Switzerland, to a Belgian private collector who kept it and treasured it until 1994. So from 1980 until 1994, this was in a Belgian collection. In 1984, it was bought by a German private collector who kept it until today. And we're very lucky because we have this wonderful trail, full trail of documentary provenance, which in the auction world is a dream. Hello, I'm Fatima Ahmed and I'm the acting editor of Polo magazine. And I'm delighted to say that this year we are once again sponsors of the Asian Art in London Art Award. Apollo was founded in 1925 and ever since then we've covered everything in the art world from antiquities to contemporary work. For many years we've been the sponsor of the Asian Art in London Art Awards and we're delighted to do so this year again. We're now going to take a look at the shortlist for the Apollo Award for an outstanding work of Indian or Islamic art from a dealer. So hi, I'm Connor from the Grosvenor Gallery and uh, yeah, we specialise in South Asian uh, modern and contemporary art. We've got a gallery here in St James's in, uh, in London. And obviously this, 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 this year we've got a, a, a lovely painting by a, a tiger by Seneca Sanana Yaki, uh, the tiger in, a, in the rainforest. And that's a subject which he's been doing for all his life. And the surface is very smooth and you'll see there are all these lovely sort of circles and the circles are the circles of life in Buddhism, which is painted over the over the composition, and then also you'll see in the in the tree there's lovely sort of uh, uh, rays of sunlight coming down onto the, onto, onto the painting. But it's overall it's a very happy, colourful picture, which which is, reflects the artist. Hi, I'm Redmond. Welcome to Peter Finers. The theme of our exhibition this year is mythical beasts and worldly creatures. Nearly all the objects are functional, however, they are also prized for their artistry. Each is decorated with some form of animal. 
either real or mythological. This exceptional shamshir or sword is made in northern India and Rajasthan. The mounts are silver, overlaid in gold and enamel and encrusted in diamonds, emeralds and rubies. The hilt shows heads of the mythological sea creature, the Makara, which features prominently in Hindu and Buddhist architecture and art. The Makara is a protector, so a very apt subject matter for the hilt of a sword. I'm Elena Nies from Marcelis Oriental Arts, and I'm here today to talk about the bronze Parvati sculpture that's been shortlisted for the Art Award. This bronze originates from southern India and represents Parvati, who is one of the most venerated Hindu goddesses in the Pantheon and whose spouse is Shiva. Together with her husband, they represent the power of creation and destruction. This bronze dates to the 11th century and shows the stylistic features of the Chola dynasty. The bronze is cast solidly in one piece, including all of the details visible, with the exception of the separately cast base. This is an early technique and contrasts with later bronzes produced in this region, which would show details that are engraved or chased after the casting process. This bronze is a very inspiring and pure example of the Chola style. The Parvati is a goddess who represents beauty, fertility and strength and the artist really managed to convey those feelings through the dynamic and elegant proportions of the bronze.